Okay, we might as well get started and just um, uh, a note that this will be recorded tonight. And um, I will also keep chat open. And if anyone has any questions as we, as we go through the presentation, um, feel free to just uh, drop them in the chat and, and I'll take a look and I'll, I'll make sure that I answer them. And <clears throat> with that, welcome. let me welcome you to our, our last line lessons of, of the term. Something new that we're trying this term where we can give some just quick ideas and quick thoughts uh, by some Baron professors and just let you um, have an idea of, of some of the cool things that, that some of our, our faculty have done before. And, and we've done these in all different schools. And I'm very happy to do this from uh, some of my experiences and some of my research um, in the School of Engineering. So my name is Tim Kurzweig. I'm the director of the School of Engineering here at Behrend. Uh, as a director of the School of Engineering, it's my, my job and my responsibility making sure that we give the best uh, academic experience to our students. So we want to make sure that our our um, programs are um, all top notch, uh, give a, an idea of, of what you can do with being an engineer. So we make sure that you're prepared for any career path, be it graduate school or um, uh, working uh, when, when you're done with that. So um, just a little bit about myself. I, uh, like maybe some of you, um, uh, uh, are getting my, or I got my early degree at uh, Penn State, I happen to go to University Park. There's a picture of me as uh, probably a 17, 18 year old kid. That is a called a phone. Um, it had a wire at that point, And that was my first dorm room um, at University Park. I then uh, did my master's and my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. So kind of Western uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I spent 16 years at Drexel University after my uh, degrees, and, and I went through all my different ranks at Drexel. I did a lot of research at Drexel. I ended my time as the vice provost of, of undergraduate education at Drexel. And in uh, the summer of 2018, it is about two and a half years ago, I was named the director of the School of Engineering here at Penn State Barron. So a little bit of a newer picture of me, although I, I think in the last couple of years, I maybe have got a couple extra gray hairs at that point. <clears throat> Excuse me, but that's a picture of me with the lion uh, welcoming me to uh, Barron, which was very exciting. At the School of Engineering, we've got uh, 11 different uh, Bachelor of Science, four-year Bachelor of Science degrees, one master's degree, about 1,600 students in residence and, and, and about 70 faculty or so. Um, we are consistently in the top 50 of undergraduate engineering education, and this is right here at Barron. This we were very proud that that our engineering programs have been recognized by this, um, and uh, we've have a lot of different research and undergraduate research opportunities here. Uh, one other thing I'd, I'd like to mention is we, we've got a brand new degree that's starting. This is called Polymer Engineering and Science. And this is uh, almost a merger of, uh, of plastics and materials and chemical engineering all together. It's an interesting way how we look at the material that makes so much that we do with plastics. And, and I think it's really relevant to have this program at uh, Penn State Barron with the large lake, that, that great lake out there, and, and making sure that we think about the end of life of plastics before we even create it. So that's, that's the idea of that new degree. And we also have a new biomedical engineering minor, and that's probably a great segue into what I want to talk about tonight um, in our Lions lessons is this idea of wireless and battery-free detection of biosignals. So the body is just full and full of different biological signals. Um, one of the ways that, that we as engineers help medicine, help science, help quality of life of all of these things is how can we monitor all of these different signals and what kind of uh, determinations can we make from this? So I was in a, uh, a group um, uh, with, with fellow engineers uh, and we were had some real goals as, as wearable biosignal monitoring um, uh, researchers. We had a couple of things that we, we always um, believed in. We wanted to make things battery free. We thought it was very important that you're not wearing or, or bulk down or have to recharge a lot of batteries. We always believed in wireless transmission. And uh, when you think about uh, med medicine and hospitals right now, so much is still wired. So that's something that we, we always want to. But then we also wanted just real-time reaction, real-time monitoring, small for print, long range. So these were always our goals. And in fact, it started like almost a bad joke. Um, and, and this is uh, a bad joke, but a true story. It says, you know, what happens when an engineer, fashion designer, and doctor walk into a bar? And believe it or not, there is some truth to this little story here, um, is that we created uh, a device that we called the belly band. <clears throat> 
And over the next uh, couple minutes, I'm going to explain some of the technology behind this belly band, how it's wireless, how it is uh, battery free, and, and how something like this works. So I must uh, say this was work that I did not do alone. This was uh, work of some really great collaborators. I was at Drexel when I did some of this work. Um, and I have to acknowledge uh, my, my fellow engineers, Dr. Dandekar, Dr. Fontecchio, the chair of OBGYN at Drexel Medical School, Dr. Montgomery, and, and believe it or not, a fashion designer was on our team too. And, um, and you'll, you'll quickly learn why we had this, such a diverse team and why it took this diverse team to be able to uh, achieve our goals. Of course, we had graduate students and undergraduate students here in research with us as well. So our first goal was uh, this idea of contraction mo uh, monitoring. When moms are getting ready to give um, uh, birth to a child, uh, there's a very natural uh, thing called laboring. And, and part of laboring is there's contractions of the uterine muscles. And um, these are need to be measured along with the, the baby's uh, heart rate, the baby uh, before it's born heart rate. So uh, there's been tons of studies. And, and again, working with, with our medical professionals, we learned um, a lot about uh, the need to uh, have moms uh, walk around, ambulate. It, it really can help to our part of the, the labor process and, and things. But what happens, believe it or not, is when moms come into the hospital, many times they're tethered down to the bed in the sense that they have all these wired contractions onto them. So something that had all of these different wires and stuff was replaced by uh, this, this little prototype on the right-hand side there where the moms can just put a piece of fabric around their bellies with different types of antennas on there and we can do some monitoring. So really exciting work and our, our goal was very ambitious. In fact, we, we learned quickly, we, we've tackled a hard problem and, and I'll show you some of our thought process. But to make something like this, this smart fabric belly band, right? Completely fabric, and I'll tell you how it works in, in a couple seconds, it takes a lot of design. It takes a lot of thought about um, uh, the knitting process. How do you knit this? How does the thread use? Um, how do you simulate this? How do you make it? And then of course, the, the rapid prototyping of the whole thing. Well, a lot of times we've heard of CAD before. CAD is something that computer-aided design, and, and we think of it maybe for 3D printing, maybe we think of it for some other devices. We started thinking of this CAD for uh, knitting, and how do we knit uh, every different thing? Now, what's neat about our knitting is that we use two different types of fabric. We use something that was more of a traditional cotton fabric, but we also used a thread uh, um, and I said fabric, but I sure really should be saying threads because we knitted a fabric together. But the other thread was um, conductive, meaning it had some sort of coating that made this pass electricity. And this is really the key to the work. The thread might look exactly the same. It's still very wearable, still very comfortable. But this is the key to the work, and I'll show some more of this in a, in a couple of seconds here. So what we were able to do is design these fabrics, and then we were able to make the fabrics. You might say, gosh, how do you make something like this? And, and boy, I didn't know this as an electrical engineer uh, from, from Penn State. I don't know how to make fabrics, but uh, our fashion designer sure did. And um, uh, we had these a couple of these different machines that had all these like hundreds of needles back and forth. And I'll show a, a video of this working in a little bit. And they would work together, and every thread was uh, was was very intentional. The, the exact placement of that thread was intentional, and that's how we could make some electrical signals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, uh, what's cool about this is that we had um, we needed something and we needed something to help us transmit signals. And what we chose was a passive RFID. And oh, I'm sorry, that picture didn't come up too good um, as, I, as I changed uh, computers here today. Um, what you might see here is uh, a fabric and that reddish fabric is non-conductive and that goldish or that metal liking fabric is, is uh, conductive. So that means that is actually making an antenna. That is in a shape of an antenna. And in this little gap, we would take an RFID tag. And maybe you've heard of RFID. Um, many things are monitored this way. Many things are tracked this way. And in fact, we use something called a passive RFID. And what passive means is that there's no battery attached to this. All this RFID signal can do is reflect information back. So it's interrogated with a, a radio frequency, you know, something almost similar to, to Wi-Fi with what we have. And it reflects back some sort of information. The information reflects back is typically just its name. And it, you say, well, how does this have a name? Is it Tim, Bob, Joe, anything? No, it's actually just a series of ones and zeros, which says, identifies it's this exact tag. 
So this is so very small. We place this into the fabric, believe it or not, we're able to do this and we make this little cool tiny pocket. And now the secret sauce here is that when the antenna stretches, so if it's a contraction, a uterine contraction, maybe it contracts. Um, uh, yeah, we do a respiration application, I'll show you in a bit, and that's when it expands. We're able to detect that because the frequency of the antenna changes just a little bit, and that's what we're able to see. So here's a picture of, of uh, what, what is called the radiant frequency, and you can see that it shifts as things are stretched. I understand you are not all electrical engineers here, so, so I don't expect you to get all of this kind of stuff. But the, the key is that because of the change of the frequency, we're able to see how this thing works. These are these knitting machines I told you about. Again, we design every single little thing together and, and these machine and oh, my one picture didn't turn out uh, okay here, um, but I'll have a picture of this, how, how this works uh, in a little bit later uh, and you can see it. So we had to make a lot, a lot of prototypes, as you can imagine, and we tried a lot of different antenna designs, we tried a lot of different fabrics, uh, we did a lot of uh, studies of talking to nurses, talking to doctors, talking to, to doulas, talking to moms about what is comfortable, and, and when moms are in labor, they really don't want to bear anything uncomfortable at all, so we talked a lot of things, and really did a lot of, of, of research, and figured out what is the best and most wearable thing as well. So what we have here is, is a, uh, a picture of the smart belly band, and we had to get creative too. How do we test some of these things? Well, we, we actually put a little pump in there and we could uh, expand it. And what it was doing is we were changing the deformation of that antenna. We were able to pick up some frequencies and actually, believe it or not, this thing started to work. So it was very exciting for us. Um, when you're an engineer, you always have to validate your results. You can't always just say, hey, this is what it is. Uh, so we had to validate. This is uh, what is the standard machine that gives you contraction monitoring. Monitoring. It's called a tocodiamanometer, and that's the big word up there, if you can say it. Uh, what I am very happy to do is all the doctors and all the hospital people call it just a toco, so I'm much happier saying that word than actually the whole tocodiamanometer, if I could spit it out. And then we had to compare these two different things, and this was the setup that we did. Uh, this setup had the exact uh, toco diamondometer or the toco on there along with our belly band. And we were able to show that we matched up really well with some of these results. And this gave us a lot of confidence, like, oh my gosh, um, after a couple of years of work, this thing is really starting to work, which is, is, is really exciting. And um, we were able to start doing some, some kind of testing with that. As I shared with you, um, we actually tackled the hard problem first. There's a much easier problem. Contractions were, were, are a challenging thing. Another thing that we looked at is at respirations, uh, especially just because of our, our collaboration with the medical school was um, with OBGYN. They, they, they looked at infants a lot and they uh, of course were afraid of um, what is called sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS and you maybe have heard of that before. So one of the things that they always have to do is do respiration monitoring on, uh, on little kids. And we said, hey, believe it or not, we've already made this. This is, this is the exact belly band and, and this is something that can be worked. So uh, in the medical space, they've got a lot of simulation um, um, things and this is called SimBaby. And we were able to tie this onto SimBaby and you can actually see SimBaby was starting to, to, to quote unquote breathe there. Let's see if my video is getting stuck. Um, sorry, it's a not, not playing back too well today. Uh, I might have to just advance forward. It, um, but the, as the baby, the simulated baby or sim baby was breathing, we were able to monitor these things. Now you look at these results and you say, gosh, Tim, how, how do you get anything useful out of that? that? That looks like very noisy signals. Well, we worked very hard on that. Beyond of just detection, we had to do a lot of data analysis on this and making sure that we were able to eliminate all of our potential false positives and making sure and we, we were able to really, even though that signal might have looked uh, noisy to one of us, uh, actually worked very uh, well. And, and again, just some results, uh, uh, simulation results. So we, we were looking for these little periods of sleep apnea. Could our uh, RFID monitor catch it? And sure enough, it could. And we, again, very exciting results about this. 
So we tackled a very physical problem where, where the body was contracting, but there's also a lot of bio signals out there. And these are typically called maybe some things that you've heard of before, these electrical body signals. So uh, the ECG or electrocardiogram is a very popular one. That's the heart rate. Um, there's also the an eye or wind muscles, EMG. So every time you make a muscle, believe it or not, there's an electrical signal that comes out of the body. And if you can detect these things, you can do a lot of work in here. So that's where some of my uh, 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 recent work had come from. Again, I was looking at RFID solutions because I think RFID solutions are, are really a smart way to do things because you can do this all without batteries. There's no power needed uh, for these passive RFIDs. You know, just as an idea, if you need another example of RFIDs, um, if you've ever done the easy pass, if you've driven on a turnpike or, or the New Jersey turnpike or the toll roads, a lot of times you hold that thing up in your car, it's already painted there or uh, pasted onto your windshield. Um, that's passive RFID. And, and a lot of it is just reflected signal about who it is. So just one more idea. <clears throat> So we were looking, can we detect biosignals with RFID technology? And um, again, we, we talked about what does that RFID give you? It gives you its tag ID or its name, and we called it that before. And sometimes it gives sensors data, but we don't even need that to for the application that we were looking at. So the application, um, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, um, last PhD students and I were looking at was biosignals um, and using this RFID, and we were looking at the heart rate. And believe it or not, there was not a lot of work done in RFID of heart rate. So that was really uh, exciting for us. And we came up with a very almost simplistic and a lot of times simple uh, answers are good answers. And we could say, well, if we could detect the heart rate and if we could just turn off that ID for a second, we could start figuring out where, um, when the heart has clicked or when it has, has, has beat and then we could start to figure out this thing. And in fact, it was such an, a novel idea um, that, that we've been recently uh, granted a patent for this. So, so this was my, my student, uh, Shrenik Vora, he's now working at Apple and uh, myself. And, um, and this was uh, one of a couple patents that we have all in this area. So I mentioned that we are starting to look for every time the heart would click, we would turn this off and then we'd measure the time between um, RFID signals that we got. So you can imagine this, it is saying its name. Remember we called it its name, right? So if, if, if it was, if, if uh, the, the um, name was 00110101100000, something like that, we would know exactly what RFID. For simplicity, I'm gonna call it Tim, my name, right? So it would repeat back, Tim, 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 Tim. Every time we get a heartbeat, it would skip it. And then it would come back and say, Tim, 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 Tim. Tim, Tim, Tim. So we could measure the time between that reporting of that RFID. And this happened, you know, hundreds of times a second. So, so we could really be accurate about this thing. And we could tell you then what is the heart rate. So um, some, some pretty neat uh, work there. And I, I won't go into all the details of, of exactly how it worked, but I, I thought I'd give you at least just one little picture of this. And, and I wanted to add one other cool thing that we had to do here. So these signals are so small from the body. And if you see my little body over here, um, they're so small from the body that we did need a little bit of amplification. So what we did, and, and this is really kind of cool, is that we had this RFID reader where I told you the RFID tag bounces back some energy. What we did was we captured a little bit of that energy and, and we called it a power harvester. And what we did was we captured some energy such that we could amplify the signal for just a little bit of time. So that's like, if there is Wi-Fi signals flying all around us right now, could I capture enough power from that Wi-Fi signal? And in fact, we can. And that was some really neat work that we had done and helped us be able to amplify this such very small signal that we could turn on off our, our RFID tag. So I had a couple of pictures here of how this whole thing worked, um, but let me get to the punchline here. <clears throat> is that when we built this thing, gosh, it started really big. And that was a heart rate simulator at the top of that picture. And gosh, we had three different boards to do this type of thing. But when we finished, it got to be this small, just the size of a quarter or so. And that was an antenna that we had to place on top of it. But all of this electronics was actually placed into such a small thing. And this was a really exciting um, uh, discovery for us that we were able to miniaturize this and get that right. But 
it all comes down to is the gold standard. And the gold standing standard, of course, is human testing. Could we compare this with something? And the human testing was really good. And, and in fact, you can't see much of a difference in signal here. There's actually a blue and a red line on each of those things. Um, one is the actual heart rate. One is our, car, our, our calculated heart rate. And uh, they line up really, really well. So we were starting to be able to do this one. Uh, uh, the contraction monitoring, we never did the, the human test. We simulated the heck out of it. We had our, our, our dummy testing, if you will. But this one was real human testing because it was easy to get an IR uh, a, a approval to do that. And we showed some really great results. And then we, we, we kept doing a lot of different things. <clears throat> When the subject was at rest to the heart rate, when it was post-exercise, we were able to see a decrease and, and things like that. Now, this time, for the first time, I, 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 I love what I do. I love research. I love uh, teaching. I love um, the, the thought of how to present uh, uh, academics to, to students. But the first time, this was the time I maybe doubted uh, myself. And, and the reason why is I was sitting at my desk and I got a phone call. And the phone call, uh, uh, out of nowhere, I, I picked it up and said, um, I am a sports scientist from the Philadelphia Eagles. I'd like to hear more about your RFID technology. And I was at Philadelphia at the time, and um, this couldn't be cooler. And one of the, the, what they were saying to me, and first I was, gosh, you can make a profession out of being a sports scientist. And indeed you can. That was cool, I thought. But what they really liked about our technology was that um, the Philadelphia Eagles, and at that time the, the coach's name was Chip Kelly, came from Oregon. And what Chip Kelly, Coach Kelly uh, uh, was known for was that he would collect so much data on every single player. They would have different RFIDs on them that they would know how they, um, uh, where they were, how, you know, how much uh, they walked, what, and from uh, uh, walking, they could figure out what is the velocity to the acceleration, how far they ran on fields, all of this stuff. And in fact, their, their uh, facility was surrounded by RFID readers so they could do this. But the one thing they didn't have was heart rate. And so uh, the, uh, the Eagles reached out to us and we said, hey, let's, let's talk. Could we do some things? I got to go down to the facilities and being a sports fan, although a Steeler fan, I must admit, uh, really a, a neat experience for us. Um, the year that we were talking to them is the year that they won the Super Bowl. And after they won the Super Bowl, they were a little too busy to talk to us uh, as much. But in the meantime, there has been a lot of things in the NFL. A company called Zebra um, had done some work with RFID, and they have been doing a lot of the RFID tracking, all that velocity positioning. Uh, acceleration um, has, has been done. So there's, there's some real practical applications for a lot of this. Now I wanted to show you one last uh, little example. And um, it's because it's so relevant to what we do. And in all of our engineering um, uh, degrees at Barron, <clears throat> we do a senior design. And the senior design is, is a capstone experience where students work on a project all year long. This is just an example of a senior design project where we took that heart rate monitor and we used um, uh, a, a smart onesie. And a onesie is, is uh, for babies, one of those first things that they wear. We would be able to put some conductive pads in there and that would sit on the heart rate and we'd be able to, to um, be able to measure the baby's heart rate just by wearing this shirt. And there was a lot of different technologies went through there. Students made an app on top of everything, which was uh, really uh, quite cool. And this was a nine month project. And this is something that's doable from, from taking that technology into wearing a shirt into uh, uh, collecting this. And this was a video that, that, that they had uh, worked on uh, now skip through a couple things here. It's uh, just heart rate testing into uh, uh, the shirt and into the heart rate. And I'll skip ahead a little bit here. And this was their app and it could detect exactly what that simulator was putting out. So they, they were really good about this. I'm sorry, the video is, is playing back pretty poorly over Zoom today. Um, but uh, then they would say, okay, well, let's make the heart rate too fast or too slow. And you could see the heart rate jump up and, and uh, send signals if there was a, a problem with the potential baby, which is really just a, a neat thing. Now, um, I'm never encouraging to stay up late at night, but if you are ever staying up late at night and watching PBS of all things, right, public broadcasting system, you maybe have seen some of this work before. And, and this was just a neat experience that we shared uh, um, from all my collaborators uh, um, uh, that, that this work. Uh, the National Science Foundation, NSF, um, uh, sponsored a lot of this work along with the National Institute of Health. 
And the Science uh, Foundation makes these videos every now and then. And typically they're on PBS probably really late at night or early, early in the morning. And they made a whole video on, on this work that, that was done here. And, and we'll see if this one plays a little bit better. It's still a little grainy, but um, uh, what was exciting about this was that we saw all of our work that came in. This was that knitting machine that I told you about. And these are some of my, my friends and collaborators. So this was uh, this RFID being placed into some of these fabrics and, and, and some of that simulation we talked about. Good Lord, how did it actually make all of these things? Um, and, and we just showed there's our, our, uh, the chair of OBGYN, Dr. Owen Montgomery. And, and, and really we had this collaborative environment, which was really a, a fun place to, oops, I, I missed my, my last picture here. I just wanted to show you a couple more parts of this if, if we could. And, and um, uh, just as, as uh, doctors are, are giving the, here was just some other examples we had done here. Remember we made a little pump there and I was one of our graduate students and we were able to pick up some of these things. Um, and there was our sim baby, remember our, our, our sim baby friend and, and, and the sim baby, we were monitoring respirations. We were also monitoring heart rate as well on, on some of these things. Um, oh, there's a good looking guy the there. Uh, that, that was me a little bit younger probably. <laughs> and uh, we were in what was called an anechoic chamber and anechoic chamber is where you can test different types of antennas. So we were able to do a lot of that. So you might say, hey, that's that's really cool, Tim, you know, um, but, you know, you were an electrical engineer. How does an electrical engineer play into all of these different things? And and a lot of it is is I had to learn a lot of stuff outside of my discipline. But one of the things that I want to tell you also is that it's OK to be outside of your discipline. You know, it, so many students stress about, gosh, am I a mechanical or an electrical engineer or something in between? And I think all the lines of engineering are blurring so much. <clears throat> such that I'm an electrical engineer, but I was doing some work in, uh, in different disciplines. I was doing a lot of work in computer science, computer engineering, all the data that we had to do, I had to get comfortable in a lot of different places. My last biology class, and, and this is unfortunately no joke at all, was I think ninth grade in high school. And um, so I had to teach myself a lot about biology and, and some of my other work, I, I was really down into a cell level as well. And so that's some of the, the, the beauty of engineers. I think we always think about lifelong learning in the sense of what do we need to know now, but what can we teach ourselves? So I, I, I really encourage you as you're thinking about engineering, um, there's so many different things at, at, at Barron, gosh, we can do so many different types of, of, of engineering. And I'll tell you what, I looked at this complete list. This is just happens to be the list of all of our majors here at Barron in engineering. And I would say every single one of these majors could lead you to a path of that very type of research that I did from the computer science to the data, to the electrical engineering, to industrial engineering even. How do you think about hospitals? How would you think about um, redoing a hospital such that it could use all of the technologies that we talked about? Mechanical, of course, deformation of things from plastics to polymers, sure. Um, all of these things is, is in, and in fact, plastics and polymer are some of the newest and, and most important things in the medical field right now. And then, and then, of course, software engineering. So I encourage you to think about all of these different types of things. Um, I'm just trying to excite you and whet your appetite a little bit about what engineering can mean for you. Um, this is what engineering meant to me. I think when, and when I started my engineering degree at Penn State in electrical engineering, um, <clears throat> I didn't know what I'd do. I, I really didn't, and that was okay. But I studied hard, I, I did very well in engineering. Um, and then I said, well, what am I gonna do? I interviewed for jobs, I had a couple job offers, but this idea of research excited me. So I went to graduate school. And when I finished my master's degree and I said, okay, I'm ready to think about a PhD because I love research. I really was committed to, to academia at that time. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to teach. I wanted to help people experience different types of skills in engineering and, and help them. And that, that was really my motivation behind my PhD. Um, my PhD was very different than this. I was doing a lot of optical work and, and how electronic, uh, electronics and optics work together. Um, so, and then my research just took me in different fields and I just always wanted to learn more and that's, that's how I got to my path. 
So with that, I'm going to end my, my lion lesson of the day. Um, I hope you found it a little bit interesting. I hope you found uh, something that, that maybe you hadn't thought about before. And I'll be happy to take any questions. If anyone has some, you can unmute or, 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 uh, to, or drop it in the chat. I'll be happy to um, watch the chat as well.